You're listening to the Back Home Network, presented by Homefield Apparel. And welcome, Hoosier fans, to this week's edition of Assembly Call Radio, where each week we discuss the most important topics in the world of Indiana basketball. This is our 245th edition of Assembly Call Radio, and it is our 829th episode overall of the Assembly Call, recorded on the evening of Wednesday, March 23rd, 2022. I'm your host, Jared Morris. And let's begin this edition of the Assembly Call, how we begin every edition of the Assembly Call, and that is with our Hoosier Proud Banner Moment. And Indiana is the national champion. When it comes down, Indiana will be champion. Smart takes a shot. The Hoosiers have won the national championship. With the score tied at 52 on Monday night, one of the best seasons in the history of IU women's basketball hung in the balance. The number three seed Hoosiers had seen their 14-point lead get whittled to nothing by a scrappy, shot-making bunch from Princeton. The Tigers missed a go-ahead three, Mackenzie Holmes snagged the rebound, and Terry Morin called the timeout to set up one of the most pivotal possessions of her coaching career. Everyone in the building knew where the ball was going, to Indiana's closer, Grace Berger. And as she usually does, Grace delivered. She hit a driving layup to put Indiana ahead 54 to 52 as one of the most raucous assembly hall crowds in recent memory erupted in both joy and relief. But 29 seconds remained. Princeton had hit tough shots all night long. The Hoosiers would have to dig in on defense and get one more stop. And as this tough minded together group has done so often over the last few years, they got it. Tough team defense culminated in one of the signature plays of Allie Patberg's career, a diving steal to secure the pivotal possession for the Hoosiers. It's what Allie Patberg does, whatever it takes to win. And banner moments are never more obvious than when they come in the form of game-winning plays that keep you marching on in the NCAA tournament toward a banner, as this historic team will now do. And it struck me, watching the game and following along on social media, that the joyful experience of being a fan of the IU women's team is so much different from the often angst-ridden experience of closely following the men's team. I'm sure you all have felt it. And there is a complex stew of reasons and historical context that explain why this is the case. But here is the most important reason. Indiana basketball fans know a great team, in all caps, when they see one. Indiana fans recognize a well-coached group that combines impressive individual skill, real toughness and grit, and a chemistry and camaraderie forged through the fires of many seasons together. And we can spot when a group seems to really love and appreciate its opportunity to wear the cream and crimson and become the best team it can be. And this Indiana team has all of it. And the fan base has connected with it in a way that we rarely see, with an uncommon combination of joy, appreciation, and confidence. That's what made this group's final moments at Assembly Hall in front of its adoring fans so fitting. It was one final in-person reminder of this group's defining qualities and its brand of winning basketball. Now Coach Morin and her team move on to the Sweet 16 to play UConn and then perhaps NC State after that. It's about as tough a road as you could imagine to the Final Four. But if you count these Hoosiers out, you simply haven't been paying attention. And no matter what happens this weekend, I plan to fully enjoy however much more basketball we get from one of the best basketball teams Indiana University has produced this century. All right, now let me introduce my esteemed co-host for tonight. To my left, he is the longtime high school basketball coach in Indiana, and he is the founder of the Delphi Bracketology Club. He remembers the days when a movie cost a dollar. Heaven help you if you ever decide to pop your collar. Play hard, but remember, fake hustle is a crime. He's the coach and it's not so many times. Well, Coach, it is Tonsoni time. Uh, what's on your mind? This is going to be a nice, relaxed off-season episode, and then all hell broke loose today. So what are you yeah. thinking about? As, uh, I'm, think- <laughs> I'm thinking about a lot of things. First of all, congratulations to the women's team. Um, you said it well in the banner moment. It- it's awesome. I was not able to go, but my son was, and you get a text uh, with the video of the whole crowd, and, he- and this place is insane 
those kind of comments. Those ladies have worked hard. Uh, Coach Morin has worked really hard for years to build this up, and it's just good to see that happen in Assembly Hall. So the first thing is to to really congratulate the ladies on a successful year and then go beat UConn. Uh, we'll be watching. Uh, I'll be in Indianapolis uh, at a local establishment uh, having a good time watching uh, the women on Saturday afternoon. So with that, then all of a sudden, you know, we get the run sheet and we're just going to talk about some things and bam, uh, driving home from my mom's the, uh, this evening, uh, a, a lot of stuff uh, hit, hits the fire. And, and, I'll, and I'll say this in general terms, we'll get into this in more detail. It, it's never um, an enjoyable time to talk about someone losing their job. Uh, families are affected, children are affected, moving has to happen and all that kind of stuff. It's never something that, uh, is a positive, but a lot of times it, it has to be done. And I believe this is a situation where coach Woodson knows where he wants to go with the program. And he felt the change uh, in direction in that spot uh, on his coaching staff was a necessary move. And just like a lot of things that coach Woodson ha has done, um, He's he's decisive, and, and he doesn't shy away from uh, what the potential ramifications will be. That's what you ultimately want in, in a leader. Uh, we can talk about timeouts and substitution and in-game stuff, but the off-the-court stuff, he seems to have a handle on what he wants to do, um, and, and there's just a lot to this decision. Uh, we wish Coach Fife nothing but the best and wherever he lands. And we all have some roster movement all of a sudden. So, yeah, from a, a, a quick show on Wednesday that I agreed upon to now, uh, <laughs> some very interesting conversations. But congratulations to the ladies. And there's always going to be change in this era of college basketball now on staffs and, and rosters. So let's get to it. Yep. All right. And also here with us to my right, he is one of our partners at the Back Home Network. He is one of the godfathers of IU Sports Podcasting. And he is the head of Indiana's prestigious sports media department. Ladies and gentlemen, you know that sound. It is the doctor, Galen Clavio, who put out a podcast earlier today with the title already out of date. And I will have you know, I listen to that damn thing, because even if it's out of date, I still listen because that's how much we respect your work. Uh, Galen. You're, uh, what's on your mind here as we start you the know, show? As I said on the podcast, I think on, in the preview, there's no better way to ensure that something will happen with IU basketball than recording a podcast and not releasing it immediately. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been an interesting day. It's really been an interesting week. I feel like we've had this entire gamut of emotions between – uh, you know, the, the men's team losing on Friday, or I guess it was Thursday of last week, although, you know, they also – they had played on Tuesday of the previous week, so we had that afterglow. And and then the women have such a successful weekend, and then this news happens. I was thinking back, like, it has been a solid three years since we had a really sleepy offseason start relatively early. And even then, you had that weird NIT run that was, you know, kind of hard to get fully into because some of the players weren't playing. So I, I keep waiting for just – you know, a nice peaceful entry point into like mid April. I don't think it's going to happen with IU athletics at this point. We're, we're just in a constant churn. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, you know, and all the new trends with the transfer portal and just how much upheaval there is anyway, I just think it's going to be hard for a lot of programs, but especially for this one right now until we get, get things a little more stable. Um, all right. So as far as what we have in store, there are a few kind of Hoosier headlines. We're going to mention them. We were going to dive into them more. We were going to kind of do an off-season reset. Obviously, those plans got scrapped uh, today when Dane Fife got fired. Um, and, you know, to a lesser extent, I think in terms of urgency as a news item, uh, Christian Lander put his name into the transfer portal and really appeared to kind of close the door on his time at Indiana. And so we're going to spend the majority of our time tonight uh, talking about those things. You know, I know some people had asked uh, if Ryan was going to be on tonight because, you know, he has had some comments about the Dane Fife situation throughout the season. Uh, he had some previous engagements, but said he might be able to pop on. Um, so if he does, we'll get his thoughts on it. Um, but either way, we're going to spend time uh, talking about it and answering your questions about what happened today. So before we get to just a few quick Hoosier headlines, um, I do want to, of course, mention our sponsors, uh, both of the Assembly Call and the sponsor, the presenting sponsor of the Back Home Network, our friends at Home Field Apparel, uh, who has the largest collection of vintage IU apparel that you're going to find anywhere 
They've got beloved logos, like two different versions of the bison. They just released a special edition of the the drop shadow uh, uh, trident on the uh, uh, the joggers that are awesome. Um, and they had their mystery boxes going. Did either one of you guys get a mystery box? Because I've seen people tweeting their mystery boxes, and it's always interesting to see like what came in the box. Because even if it's schools that you don't care about, it's like. Okay, but I would wear all of those shirts because the logos are all really great. Did you guys happen to pick up one of those this time? I didn't. I was out of town. It was going to be hard to order. I mean, I've I've still got my you know one of my big new <laughs> Saturday shirts uh, from the last go around on that. So I have to kind of space out my home field specials. Otherwise, I won't be living in my house anymore. I'll be in a like in, very much in a van down by the river. So yeah. which will be a very comfortable homeless person and stylish. Too. Yeah, well, yes, 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 yes. I have Villanova shirt on right now <laughs> underneath the uh, Indiana baseball sweatshirt, and I'm seriously thinking about having an automatic deduction every two weeks into a home field account. You know, you used to have those Christmas <laughs> accounts, but you just take some money, and when it hits a hundred, then I can buy three shirts, and then uh, wait again till it hits a hundred and because uh, I ran into Connor at the Big Ten tournament. I just cussed at him. I said, dude, I, I, you have more of my money than I have my money. And I just can't resist. It's just so good. It's just good stuff. I know there's people who probably think we're making this up. Like, oh, you guys have to say this. You're getting paid by them. No, we're just true home field apparel degenerates uh, who get yeah. everything that they put out. And I'm really thinking hard about getting that strut of destiny shirt for St. Peter's, which I, is an so amazing. I, I combo ordered the strut of destiny shirt with the block pitchfork joggers, which that's a perfect way to do things. Cause then you get free shipping. Uh, so don't, I yes. just, you just do it now, Jared, while we're doing the podcast, put the order in please. That, that is awesome. Well, Look, go to homefieldapparel.com, browse everything because they've got so much good stuff. Uh, and if you, unlike us, have not ordered from Home Field Apparel before and can actually use your new customer discount, uh, use the promo code HOME, H-O-M-E, and you'll get 15% off your first order. That is promo code HOME for 15% off at homefieldapparel.com. Okay, a couple quick news items. Number one, the most important of all, the women face UConn on Saturday at 2 o'clock Eastern on ESPN. As you've probably heard, that game against UConn is in Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is 79 miles away. So real nice job there on the, the seating and the, you know, putting people in brackets there by the selection committee. Um, but whatever, you know, this is an IU team that's tough minded and isn't going to care. We know they're going to go play their best basketball. Um, so, you know, if they can, you know, this is not maybe the invincible UConn teams of past years. This is a beatable one. Um, so I can't wait to see uh, what the women's team can do. You know, Galen, the other story that I really wanted to spend some time on today was Adidas announcing that they're launching an NIL network that athletes um, from their sponsored schools can participate in. I think we'll table that. Do you have like a 30 second big picture thought on that that you can provide? Because it is really noteworthy and I don't want to forget about it, but we'll probably stick a pin in it for a future episode. Yeah, no, I think it's a big topic, and I guess the, the Cliff Notes version I would look at right now is we don't know what the terms are. This is something I think Adidas had to do to stay relevant in the marketplace as Nike is you know just such a big player. And also Adidas, I think, had to get back in the good graces of a lot of schools given everything that happened a few years ago. Uh, but look, I think we're going to see more and more of these trends, whether it is these sorts of deals or NIL collectives, more money is flowing into the pockets of players and it's the free market essentially doing it. These are corporations or these are individuals saying we're going to go in and set up something financially. And it's a, it's something that deserves a deep dive, but certainly as of now, it's a good thing for Indiana because there is a systematized way for IU and their shoe contract to help get recruits to Bloomington. And, and that right now is a very important thing. Yep. So we'll talk about that more as the offseason goes along, and maybe it'll be helpful to wait a little bit anyway, and we'll get more details um, and see what happens there. And then, you know, I think the other headline is just what everybody's doing, which is keeping an eye on the transfer portal. Um, you know, you saw Christian Lander put his name in the transfer portal. Uh, Andre Corbello from Illinois put his name in the transfer portal. So there's going to be a lot of names going in there. The other thing to pay attention to, and Indiana was the beneficiary of this last offseason when Shaka Smart moved from Texas to Marquette. And Tamar Bates, who was committed to play for Shaka Smart at Texas, decided to reopen his recruitment, uh, 
you know, there was a pre-existing relationship there. Indiana came in and was able to land a really important recruit. Well, as coaching movement is happening now, you're seeing some of the same things happening. And one of the names to know is Malik Renault uh, from Montverde, uh, who played with um, Jalen Hood Shafino, and he was committed to Florida. But Mike White left Florida to take over for the very lowered expectations at uh, at Georgia. And uh, so Malik has, you know, announced that he's decommitting um, and reopening his recruitment. Indiana had a pre-existing relationship there, and so they'll be involved. So. Just something to keep an eye on. If you do want to track uh, the transfer portal, verbal the Verbal Commits uh, Twitter account is really good at, you know, I mean, it's basically a fire hose of information at this point, so be careful. Uh, but it is a pretty good way to keep tabs on all of that stuff. Okay, gentlemen, but the biggest news item is Indiana uh, firing Dane Fife, uh, which, you know, I would say, you know, I think... You know, a lot of us, I think, as we've gone through the season, Coach, have heard things about the situation that haven't been positive. Um, and it's not always, honestly, like secret backdoor insider information. I had several people throughout the season who went to games that would message me after the game and say, boy, the relationship between Fife and the other coaches seems strange. You know, just the interactions aren't usually what you expect. You know, and so I think there were some red flags there. Um, you know, there were red flags about things that had happened behind the scenes from a recruiting perspective. In fact, comments that Dane had made publicly on NIL, you know, that didn't really seem to align with how Indiana was trying to position itself as a, you know, a forward thinker in terms of NIL and certainly a program that wanted to take advantage of NIL from a recruiting perspective. Um, you know, and then just, you know, kind of other things that, you know, you hear maybe third or fourth hand that certainly aren't fit for the airwaves. But just that kind of make you think, huh, boy, if that's actually true, you know, this these relationships really aren't going well. And so I think for that reason, when the news came down today, it did not shock me that Indiana and, and Dane Fife were were moving on. Um, it disappointed me in a big way, because I think when Dane Fife was hired, you know, there's a storybook quality to it. You know, this is a guy who, whether you want to call him a legend or not in Indiana basketball lore, is a very important figure. He's the all-time steals leader. He was, you know, an outspoken figure during that transition time from Bob Knight to Mike Davis. He was a key figure on one of the, you know, the best Indiana teams of the last 30 years that was a runner-up uh, to Maryland. And despite, you know, coaching at a Big Ten rival, he's been a guy who has kept a very engaged presence with IU fans, you know, on Twitter and doing radio interviews and making it known that he's a proud Hoosier, even as he's, you know, with Michigan State. And so I think... A lot of people, you know, me included, were very excited when he was hired and had high hopes for what that would mean. But it just seems like almost from the beginning, it just is a relationship that didn't seem to work. And if you think back, Coach, to some of the things that we talked about in the offseason, looking forward to this season, one of the biggest question marks we had was, OK, how is this staff going to gel? Because this Mike Woodson has no working relationship with any of these assistant coaches. You know, and we know how important that is to a team. And, you know, as they go through the season, how is that going to work? Um, and clearly in this case, it didn't work that well. And so, you know, the only other thing I would say is, you know, you look at how this was handled and obviously Mike Woodson took full ownership of it, you know, with that statement. I think a lot of people expected, you know, once the rumor started to trickle out that when it was a positioned publicly that it would be positioned as more of a mutual parting of the ways. It very clearly was not, you know, Dane Fife was fired and Mike Woodson took ownership of that. And the statement made that clear. And I guess, you know, when I look at that, you know, for an IU guy to fire an IU guy and position it the way that they did, knowing what kind of the blowback and the reaction would be, I would think that would give you a little bit of pause and say, what must have been going on for this to be the outcome? You know, whether you know or have heard of any of those things or, or any of that stuff. But I think that, to me, really speaks volumes about a situation that must have really deteriorated um, to just a breaking point that we saw today. And so for that reason, I think we're all fairly you know, disappointed that it didn't work out with Dane Five because we wanted it to. But given what the situation seemed like, I have a really hard time viewing this as anything but a positive moving forward because it will give Mike Woodson a chance to find an assistant coach that he has a better working relationship with. 
And ultimately, that's the most important thing. You may be able to look back and say there was a mistake at the hiring point, but I think for what has happened through the first, you know, this first year of Mike Woodson's tenure, this seems like absolutely the best decision for what the program needs moving forward. Yeah, I think um, this was a move that had to be made if you're putting all the pieces together. I think it shows Coach Woodson being decisive. And as a head coach, you need to have a staff that you know um, – buys into what you're trying to do, uh, is loyal to what you're trying to do, and, and is uh, an, an appropriate member of the staff. Um, my role as an assistant can't be bigger than the head coach. You know what, you're, what you need to do, you do it, um, and you do that job well, and you move the program forward. Uh, it just seemed that this was an ill fit from the start uh, in, in some of the things that we heard publicly and we, we saw uh, on game nights and some of the other things that, that, that we were privy to. Uh, and it doesn't mean that, that Coach Fife is a, a, a bad person or anything. It just wasn't a good fit. Uh, there, uh, I have worked on staffs um, as a head coach that the assistants and I didn't get along and we had to make changes. Uh, I've also been an assistant where after a year I, I realized I couldn't work with that head coach because the philosophy was just different in how things were handled uh, in the locker room, in practice, and so forth. So there obviously were, were some philosophical differences, uh, maybe some things that happened that the, the head coach didn't like as far as what the appropriate role was for, for Coach Fife, and, and we're, we're not going to know other than the official statement. But I think this is a, a, a solid move for Coach Woodson. It shows that Coach Woodson's in charge. And what I question is, did was it his decision to bring Fife in in the first place, or was it heavily suggested from elsewhere? And then I kind of like Coach Woodson saying, you know what? I got us back to an NCAA tournament. I got us 21 wins. Now I'm going to pick the rest of the staff the way I want to pick it. If that went down that way, that that's that's some gravitas that I like uh, from from that this coaching fraternity. Is is you know if you hire Coach Woodson, you let Coach Woodson build his staff. I don't I, I, you know now looking back on it, if you hire Coach Woodson and then try to fit this piece and this feat piece in we all kind of praised that I'm not sure that might have been the best thing uh overall obviously it didn't work out um if that was the, the situation so there's a lot of stuff that I'm not privy to and don't know but the head coach has to have control of his staff has to have a staff that he feels is a hundred percent uh with the program and it's obvious uh with, with the quick turnaround here that he didn't feel that way about coach Fife and we all wish it had worked because he embodied Indiana basketball, that toughness, that grit, um, that following a three-point shooter, you know, that we seem to do a lot of. Um, <laughs> and, and that and and that doesn't need to take away what he, he did for Indiana University this year or on the basketball court. You know, you can still like Dane Fife for, for what he's done. It's just this was not a, a good mix. And if we want Indiana basketball tonight not go 9-11 and 11 in the Big Ten, then Coach Woodson needs to have the staff that he needs to have. So I think it had to happen. Galen, what are your thoughts on today's move? I mean, I'm not shocked, I guess. It, as I think I echo most of what Coach said. It, it was an odd fit in a lot of ways from the beginning. The whole thing's just been weird to think about, though. And that's like what I keep coming back to, the, the fact that – if you were at games and you were watching the bench, you could tell something was a bit amiss. You mentioned that you were getting messages on that earlier on in the year. And then just the way that this whole day went down. I mean, you know, normally, even in situations where there's a disagreement or there's a real conflict between people and it's somebody who's kind of from inside the family – you're not going to have things play out the way that they did. The, the person who's leaving is getting fired is allowed to come out and say, Hey, I've had a great time here. I, I I'm going to take things in a different direction. They make a statement first. It, it kind of softens the blow and, and makes everything seem like it was by mutual consent. This it's a leak followed by a statement where it's unequivocal that uh, Fife has been fired. And then like three hours later or whatever, you get, uh, you know, a, a short, nicely worded, but short statement from Fife. Uh, I looked at that. I was like, wow, there's a message there. Uh, there's, there's something that is being said in the way that this is being done. And look, I, I think it's dangerous to speculate exactly on 
what all the conflicts were. Certainly there's, if you follow anything on social media or if you're on any message boards, you've seen a lot of that already. You don't need me here to repeat it for you. Um, but I would, I would just say that it's, it's unfortunate, as you guys said, and I think it's also just kind of a peculiar chapter in Indiana basketball history from a coaching perspective. Not quite as peculiar as a coach, you know, selling out the school he's working for to help a different school recruit a guy, uh, as we've seen in the last 15 years. But it is, it's even maybe more peculiar in a way because it really felt like Fife getting hired here was kind of like, wow, okay, we're really getting the band back together. We've got IU players from multiple generations, all you know, all of whom played for night. you got a guy who coached at the college level for a bunch of years as a top assistant in the conference. And I'm, I, mean, I guess I'm surprised it didn't work out a little bit better. I understand there were some personality conflicts. Normally, people in these sorts of situations can figure out ways to put those things behind them. And that, I guess, maybe is the thing I find the most interesting. And as Coach said, it's not necessarily uh, an unusual thing in coaching circles, but it, I, I was a little bit surprised that it ended up like this. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's take a quick break, and then obviously, when we come back and resume talking, we're going to continue talking about uh, kind of the many layers of this decision and what it means. Uh, for Indiana basketball. So that's what we will do here coming up on Assembly Call Radio. We will continue talking about the story of the day Dane Five fired uh, by Indiana. And we'll also talk a little bit about Christian Lander's decision uh, to go into the transfer portal. That's next. Stick with us here on the Assembly Call. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here live. 518 people watching live for an off-season show. That is, uh, that is, uh, those are some numbers, man. Crazy, uh, crazy off-season. Yeah, Greatest. I mean, yeah. And look, I don't, I don't think we're going to get into. I think there's a, there's a lot of like rumors that have gone through the rumor mill, and I don't even think it makes a lot of sense to, you know, to address a lot of those here, you know, on a on a show like this. I just, I guess, you know, Galen, you kind of alluded to this a little bit. Is there any way that just the way that today planned out was more um, like uh, not incompetence, but just like uh, like they, they didn't put the right spin on the statement? Or do you think it was very much a well, an intentional way to present it that way? I don't know. I, and I don't want to, I, I can't speak specifically to the motivations. I was, and I was simply just looking at the way that the statement read more than even necessarily the timing. Yeah. You know, it, the, the statement was pretty definitive in a way that normally if you're going to have that level of definition and things are on good terms, you let the other person at the very least kind of get out in front of it a little bit. And, and so that was really the, the, the thing, I guess they got my antenna up a little bit. I don't think it matters and look, I think ultimately it is certainly, I think Woodson's prerogative. And I think Woodson looks at it from the standpoint of, I need to put my stamp on the program or continue to put my stamp on the program. And if I'm going to make a change, I'm going to come out and say it first because that's what a program would do. Um, now that's kind of an old school approach, certainly. Um, but I don't know. I, 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 I was surprised just how everything played out. It's certainly a choice, and I think that ultimately it does probably say a little bit about what the atmosphere was like as things were wrapping up. Yeah, and there's probably – there's maybe a few assumptions that I've seen a lot of Indiana fans make that I, I think it would at least be worthwhile to rethink or reconsider whether those assumptions are as rock solid as some people think they are. Yeah. You know, one is that Fife's position at Michigan State, even though he'd been there for a while, was super solid. And he was, you know, you know, leaving this great position to come to Indiana, you know, because there has been some talk that Tom Izzo was looking to shake up his staff, mm -hmm. you know. And so I would, you know, I would just keep that in mind as you consider this. And the other is that, you know, a lot of people, I think, assume the Dane Fife was brought in here and basically told he was going to be the next coach. And I think yeah, like I, the, the, the spin of that day more from social media, like kind of positioned it that way, but that was never like the official way that it was presented. Well, 
No, um, it, it never was. No, it never was. Although I think, um, I wonder if some of the principals felt that way, even if it was never actually described as such. I think that's. Oh, about I think a, that might be true. I think that so, might be but, true. But you got to keep in mind in in the way that information travels now. Um, I, all it takes is one party thinking that, and that leads to a bunch of other people assuming that that's the case because, hey, I've yes. got uh, someone who's saying that who would certainly know, even though that may not actually be the case. So, yeah, I look, I think um, that there there was clearly some early friction, not even between um, necessarily between the coaches, but I just think there was some early friction in general that was um, – it was, it was curious, but you're like, okay, this will obviously calm down. And then we didn't hear much about it. And then it just kind of popped back up again here at the end. And it's like, oh, well now a bunch of things make sense that didn't before. Yeah. Yeah. There's, you thought? Uh, well, yeah. You know, without knowing for sure who said what and whatever, you, you just tend to be careful on that. But, um, you know, that that's my position. You got to know your appropriate role inside a staff. A and I wonder if those roles were being, however, being defined throughout the year, didn't match up to either what Woodson thought of that role or what Fife man thought of that role. Uh, and that created some issues. I, I know early last summer, there were some issues with who was getting offers and who was being suggested in the rumor mill uh, come out that uh, things weren't going well um, in the recruiting world in, in oh. that direction. And, and so that could just be, um, you know, job performance too. There could be a level of, you know, evaluation of, of here's what I expected you to do on that front. And it didn't get done. We saw that with Schilling, um, you know, with, with letting Schilling go uh, under Archie Miller. So there could be some performance based stuff too, that we just, we just don't, uh, know, know about, but you put all those factors together. Uh, and, and I think this is, um, you know, again, you never, you never like firings for anybody. It, it, it's right. just tough. And sometimes yeah. it has to happen. Um, but I think this is good that coach Woodson says, this is the program I want to rebuild. And this is the way I'm going to do it. It's similar to the suspensions. Um, and, and I think that, that he, he wants to do it a certain way. And I think that's strength. Um, and sometimes that could be a negative, though, as well, if you don't change certain things, uh, your approach uh, and learn. Uh, sometimes us coaches can be strong headed too much. So but I think this is a sh sign of strength that you asked me to come back and rebuild this program. Um, and, and I need to make this decision right now. And so I think it's good. Um, I, guess, I guess the one thing you may be right. And, and I, I hope that you're right. I think the problem for perceptionally for a lot of IU fans is there's still a lot of people that don't fully trust Woodson as a college head coach. Um, and that may not be fair. Uh, and I, you know, but I do think the jury's still out a little bit on whether he's actually going to be the type of person and the type of coach that can take this program where people want it. People look at Fife and they look at a guy who they perceive as an incredibly successful assistant coach, who's just been waiting for the right opportunity. And he's an IU person. And as we know from other former IU players who are coaches, uh, fans have a tendency to um, rate perhaps higher than they should that person's actual ability to do the job. And, and we don't necessarily know what, what Fife's uh, outcome would be there. But I could see how people looking at this would say, well, wait a minute. Um, why are you getting rid of the IU former player who's also coached in college at the assistant level for a bunch of years? But I think this is where perception tends to not meet reality particularly well because all that most people see is is the, the 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 exterior the veneer of whatever is going on and how people are conducting themselves rather than how the actual game uh is being coached and how the actual activities are being done yeah that's really yeah, and, well said. and galen I, i'm one of those that needs to see better in game better offense yeah uh, there's still some questions uh, about coach woodson's leadership but as a head coach, he has the right to pick his staff and make decisions, and he did it decisively. And to me, that's that's a um, a strong, bold move that I think bodes well, you know, and eases what <laughs> what questions I have a little bit. Um, the end of the year, and then something like this um, is easing some of those tensions that that I have about uh, the overall direction. I just think it. 
it, it, it had to happen. And, and like I said, I've been a part of staffs where it's been mutual. Like I, I can't work for you and you really don't want to work with me because we're just two different types of people. Um, and, and I've just moved on, you know, I'll find something else to go do. And, and neither person necessarily, you know, uh, I think there's a little more in this situation than that. Um, I, I think there had to be a real mess up somewhere, um, either in, you know, attitudes, behaviors, you know, uh, thoughts about, you know, positions or whatever else than just job performance. But, uh, you know, coach had to do what he had to do. And, uh, you know, the worst thing I, as a coach is being told you have to hire people. Right. Um, and, and I don't know that Dolson did that. Um, there is some talk about that. Um, but if you hire a head coach, you should let them pick their staff and otherwise there's going to always be issues. And if, if that was the case, then this was a, you know, a powder keg from the start, um, that, that, you know, eventually exploded. Hold that thought. Let's, I want to talk about that at the top of segment two. So we'll start segment two right now. Um, all right, <clears throat> here we go. Hey guys, it's Gene Steratore, CBS officiating analyst and retired big 10 basketball official. You know, I have never listened to the assembly call. And to be honest, I don't intend to. If you listen, make sure you ignore anything Ryan says about officiating. He's really good from the seat of his pants, but I wouldn't trust him on the court with a whistle around his neck. Time has proven him wrong on virtually everything. Take care. We'll talk soon. Okay, Gene, but then who do we trust with the whistle around their neck? Hey, can we talk real about question. real quick? Can we, can we talk about Courtney Green and Bo Borowski being in Philadelphia for Purdue's regional? I'm so excited. This is I, this. I almost want a camera oh. on Ryan watching these games. It'll be delightful. Oh man! All right, you know, uh, thank th- you for that. Poor, poor Bo Borowski. <laughs> I, I, I've never liked Bo either, but I was courtside uh, for the Big Ten tournament and man the physicality down there i don't know how you officiate to 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 be totally honest i got a whole new perspective being right off the the court of a a collegiate game for five or six games man that's some physical play so you know poor Bo. everyone knows his name it's easy name to say and uh you know who someone in our chat is he married into the family so sometime we we might have to have Bo on the show just for just for some fun yeah we might uh, all right. Tonight's episode is also, in addition to being sponsored by the Back Home Network, is sponsored by our friends at Superior Insulators, uh, owned by longtime listener and IU season ticket holder Brad Brosmer. And, you know, we've been telling you all about the great work that Brad's company has done, installing air barrier systems and spray foam for the IU Excellence Academy, and how they also worked on the IU football locker room, Marching 100 Hall, and many other buildings on campus. And that work has been all the more impressive because they aren't even based in Bloomington. But now, thanks to their recent acquisition of spray foam insulators in Bloomington, they will be able to grow and service the Bloomington market more efficiently through local teams and support. Uh, And it helps them achieve their long-term objective of having a physical presence in Bloomington. So if you're anywhere in southern Indiana and you need residential or commercial insulation, visit insulators.com to learn more. That's in seal aiders spelled like it sounds I N S E A L A T O R S. Uh, and you will be able to learn more. And thank you, Brad, as always for your continued support of the show. So guys, as we were talking about in the break, you know, on the one hand, this is surprising because, you know, you bring back Dane Fife with his IU ties and the excitement of the hiring and very, very few people would have thought, you know, on the day of the hiring, Hey, this is only going to last a year. But, you know, coach, you brought up an interesting point, which is that, you know, if you don't let a head coach pick his staff, you know, you are setting yourself up for, you know, if not trouble, at least kind of a risky situation. And the hiring of Mike Woodson was just different than normal. You know, at least the way that it's presented that I understand it is that, you know, Scott Dolson kind of had this vision for how he wanted to to run the program, inspired somewhat by what Michigan has done with Juwan Howard and Phil Martelli and kind of how that whole thing has gone and kind of had this idea of, okay, let's bring Mike Woodson back, you know, as this figure from IU pass, but also a proven coach, even though it's at the NBA level. And we're going to have a system that's more appealing, you know, to college players who want to get to the NBA. You know, Mike Woodson has the presence of a head coach. We think he's a good coach, but he doesn't know the college game. So let's pair him with Thad Mata, 
who is one of the most successful Big Ten coaches of the last few decades. Let's bring in another Indiana guy who has Big Ten experience in Dane Fife. Let's get some continuity with Kenya Hunter. And then let's find a young assistant who is kind of a, a known proven recruiter in Yasir Rosemont. And let's put these guys together. None of whom had a pre-existing working relationship, you know, and then, you know, Mike Woodson along the way added Armand Hill, you know, as we know, as the season went on, you know, he brought in Randy Whitman and some other people on a consulting basis. And so the way that Indiana set up its staff was just very, very strange and unique. And it doesn't necessarily mean it was bad. It was just different. And so, you know, to not expect any kind of turmoil or trouble or issues, especially when you have, you know, successful men with egos kind of thrown into this high pressure situation of Indiana basketball, it, powder keg, I think, is a really good word for it. Um, and again, I don't think Dane Fife is the one that people would have predicted would be the one that there was the issue with. You know, the only thing that I will say, and again, we're not going to get into a lot of the stuff that we've heard because, A, I don't. You know, I don't know if it's true. I've never verified any of this stuff, and I'm not a reporter. I don't think it's our place to say this stuff. The only thing I would say is, you know, there's a lot of people that I kind of know that are in the know or that I trust on these kinds of matters. They have all had the exact same reaction to this that we have. You know, and that leads me to believe maybe story A isn't true or story B isn't or whatever. But it certainly leads me to believe that enough of the different things that you know we heard or just that we saw with our own eyes are true to make this the decision that we think, which is a positive for the program moving forward. But to your point, it was probably a pretty difficult thing to expect there not to be some kind of turmoil or turnover at some point with this coaching staff when it was kind of brought together. And, you know, yeah, to a certain extent, extent you know now that mike woodson has kind of gotten in gotten a feel for what this is going to be like i'm sure he has a different vision now than he had a year from now for what it's going to take to succeed and you know fife was just the guy that didn't fit that vision right now yeah it, it, it's just it, it goes back to the very beginning of the hire you're absolutely correct to, to piece things together and and i thought it it all made sense when you brought all these other factors in but now looking back on it as a as a former coach, if I got hired to go back to my alma mater, but everyone said I had to t keep this guy and keep this guy and keep this guy, it would all depend on how bad I wanted to go back. And then I probably would say, well, I, I, I need to be reserve the right to make some changes if it doesn't go well. And, and you know, I'm not at the collegiate level, but he, it's more necessary at the collegiate level to bring in your guys, uh, guys that will help you run your system and guys that you trust uh, and when you're forced, uh, if it was, we, we don't even know if that was the situation either, but it just seems like it was um, that, that Dolson made these suggestions to have these people around the program uh, to, to help out. Uh, I don't know that I, I can totally see whether it's ego driven or whatever, where I wouldn't like that. Uh, and, and then if there was differences and behaviors and poor performance, then that would really get under the skin of a head coach. And I'm trying to change this up and, and this coach isn't doing what I think he should be doing. That's really a tough situation uh, to deal with because you want to respect the, your, your situation, who, who hired you and all of that. Thankful for all of that. But man, this isn't working. So, um, you know, it just, it just goes back to this was not a good mix. Uh, and, and however Fife came to be here at Indiana, it wasn't the right decision uh, back when he was hired. And it just kind of showed its face throughout the, the season. And, and I'm glad that Coach Woodson had the ability to, to make the change. And that might be why the statement came out from Coach Woodson, too. It, it, I made the decision on the, uh, on the suspensions. I'm making the decision on the coaching staff. This is, this is the program I've been hired to lead. I like that. Um, um, I do. And, and like I said, I, I'm not the biggest Woodson fan totally yet. And I still like that because you have to have a cohesive staff, at least from loyalty and knowing your positions on the staff and working cohesively. And there's only one guy who can really understand that. It can't be an athletic director. Can't be an associate athletic director. Uh, it, it's the head coach. Uh, and, and if the head coach doesn't get the job done, then you move on to another head coach. Uh, if, if he makes the wrong decisions, but you got to give that ability to the head coach and and that's might have been some of the problem with the coaching staff all, all season long you know it's also possible galen you know again when you word a statement like that 
that, you know, look, if, if, if Dane Fife through things that had happened, if there were, you know, bad situations or maybe people he had rubbed the wrong way, that could be a statement that's meant to signal, you know, Hey, you know, maybe we do, you know, we don't, uh, stand for these things we're we're really moving forward from this you know and so it's it's possible that that is that that is part of the calculus there and again that's that's pure speculation yeah. on my part um but it is like it is it's a statement that makes you ask questions because it is different than how these things go you know and so i am you know i i am you know kind of thinking out loud but curious about you know the the strategy there because it does unless you just chalk it up to like not great PR or whatever. It seems like a very wow. intentional statement, which I think is probably the better, the better answer. Look, uh, yeah, and again, it's it's just hard to tell because there's just there's so many things we don't actually know that we're just speculating on. Um, and look, I think if there have been problems that have manifested, it hasn't really been that public. It hasn't really been something that fans have noticed. It hasn't been something media has noticed. If it's something that players have noticed or if it's something that has, you know, been noticed by coaches in the community or on the recruiting trail, I don't think the statement really – I mean, it makes a little bit of a difference in that, okay, you can point to that and say, well, whatever the problem was, we need to make a change, and so we're going to make that change, and maybe it just acts as a blanket thing there. Um, but again, this is where I think we can overanalyze a little bit because we end up – not just imagining all of the th elements that made up the scenario, but then imagining why things were done in, in the way that they were done. Um, so yeah, I, it's tough because again, I think as, as we saw with, with Fife's statement, I mean, this is still a guy that's, it's he's part of the IU family. He, you know, he, he came back and, and contributed for a year as an assistant coach. And obviously it, it if it had gone well, he, we wouldn't be even having this discussion, but I am a little bit uh, trepidatious about going too far in on trying to figure out exactly what all the motivations were beyond just being surprised that things played out the way that they did. Yeah. So, so where does Indiana go from here? Um, you know, obviously now they have a, an opening on the staff. Do you, and, you know, and look, I mean, I, I think, you know, we all know now that Kenny Payne was hired by Louisville. He is, you know, a longstanding, you know, he is Yasir Rosemond's mentor. Um, you know, Yasir's mentioned, mentioned that on interviews that was, you know, he was recommended, you know, to Mike Woodson, you know, from, you know, Kenny Payne, uh, you know, World Wide West, those guys that he knew from his time at the Knicks. Um, and so that there's been no indication that he's leaving, but it it would seem pretty crazy to think that Kenny Payne's going to take a job and wouldn't then consider Yasir, who had obviously a pretty successful season at Indiana by all accounts. So we have to see where that's going to play out. Um, but what do you think Indiana looks for now in an assistant coach? And it's, I think it's a really interesting question to, to frame right now, because, you know, while I think we, and a lot of the people that we talk to feel like this, is, you know, was a good decision for Indiana based on things that we've heard. It's also really interesting to consider how Mike Woodson uses his staff, you know, because, you know, again, bringing in these different consultants and doing different things like this was not a traditional setup. And so if that's going to be the go forward plan where you know, there's going to be a lot of different consultants coming in and helping with offense and stuff, what is the role of the assistant coach? You know, is this someone who's just doing scouting and recruiting? You know, is it more kind of, you know, building relationships with players and doing that part of it? Because we often talk about, well, let's get, you know, a good offensive guy or a good defensive guy. Well, does that matter? I mean, if the offense and the defense are going to be Woody's vision and he's going to bring in his own people to help him execute that vision, then really it would seem like you're looking more at someone who is going to get players and establish relationship with players and put together good scouting reports. Yeah. I mean, you know, now, maybe that's not how it'll be moving forward, but that seems like what he was looking for this year from assistants. For, for my money, you got to get someone who can recruit because that's the biggest deficit Indiana faces right now as a basketball program is they just don't have the, the, the top level talent and the depth to be able to compete at the highest levels, not just to the conference, but of college basketball as a whole. You know, I think given the makeup of the staff right now, and the fact that you no longer have Dane Fife, who had a lot of background in the Midwest recruiting these areas, I really think you need to get somebody who can recruit these areas really well. You need to have somebody that knows the state of Indiana inside and out, 
uh, knows yeah. the the surrounding areas because you're still going to draw a lot of top level talent. And and you know I'm tired of seeing you know some of the best and most competitive players go into Purdue or or go into Ohio State. Uh, you got to have somebody that can go in and win those battles. I think the big mistake that IU fans will make again is immediately thinking, oh, well, let's hire an IU person. Um, you know, let's – I've seen some names bandied about. And, you know, look, I think there's a couple of good IU assistants who are out in college basketball right now that would be really intriguing. Uh, I've thought about Keith Smart a lot, who's an assistant at Arkansas, and that program is certainly rolling. But I don't know that Keith Smart checks any of the boxes I just listed – because I don't know, I, I don't know how well he can contribute in the areas that IU needs to have success in, in order to get back to where they need to be. And so, I think today, with with the, the incredible uncertainty, with the transfer portal, with with where recruiting is at, with where NIL is at, you've got to have somebody that primarily can come in and get recruits. I think everybody on staff has to do that. Um, I think you can handle the teaching on your own. But you don't even know if you're getting good players how long you're going to have them there to teach in the first place. So I would rather get people that can come in, get the best players, do so in a way that's going to make uh, the talent pipeline just continually go, and then figure out from there, okay, how do we mold these players into what we want? Yeah, Coach, you got what's your sense on it. You, you get another yeah. <laughs> You know, get another yaw. You you got to get a young guy who can recruit, who has some connections, um, to bring in recruits. And you need young guys, relatively young guys, to, um, to get to know these guys and and selling point to come to, come to Indiana. Coach Hunter and Woodson seem to be pretty tight, uh, and at least that's the word I get that they they gelled this year, uh, and, and that's a good working relationship. And and I think. The, the same can be said for, for Coach Yah uh, as well. Um, but Coach Yah, just, uh, he, you just want to follow that guy. I mean, he's just – there's some energy. And right now with the transfer portal and, and recruits coming in, you want to get your top 50, top 100 recruits or you're going to the transfer portal. I mean, the, the recruiting now is transfer portal to get these guys in. And then, you, you know, you're not going to look at – take as many chances with high school guys that aren't your top guys anymore – uh, I'm not happy about that, but you, you just need someone that the, the players can relate to because I think a lot of, a lot of this and what Woody did, I think, well, this year was get these guys to, to have a better attitude. Even when they were struggling, they bounced back. It seemed like the chemistry was better. And I think that's something that's not in the offensive efficiency that I always say is bad this year and defensive efficiency and all of those things. Uh, but this team didn't quit even in the Michigan game. And, and, and I think, get people in here that really make this program pop. And, and when I see Kenya and when I see Ya, and, and to some extent Woody with how he uh, interacts with the players, that's what you need. Now you just got to go out and find him, all right, um, uh, and, and, and use your resources to find that kind of guy. And then you can teach him the offense and defense. And, and if this young person is in this position, they know how to – how to run workouts and, and build development that's going on in every gym in every town. People are doing workouts and some are better than others, but go find that, go find that up and comer that, that, that'll be in that cook hall all the time, you know, working out those kids. And, and when they come in for recruits that the family and everyone just gels with, I think that, again, going back, that's part of the reason that, that we heard that Fife had some struggles uh, on, on some of these visits and, and recruiting things, go get another. Yeah. Um, and, and obviously it doesn't have to be an IU guy. And I think we're getting to see now why some of us weren't excited about getting an IU guy anyway, because it's so hard to make a decision on performance or removal if you bring in an IU guy. And it'll happen with Coach Woodson. If he's not meeting expectations in four or five years, it'll be very hard to make a move in, in that direction. Um, so I, I, I don't that, – that's not a criteria for me. A recruiter – uh, a player relationship yeah. guy, someone who's fired up uh, about spending a lot of time in the office uh, helping the program. And, you know, what you just said, that's the other thing that I think should give people pause if they're questioning, like, whether this was a good decision or not. An IU guy is always going to get the benefit of the doubt in these situations. If for no other reason than everybody involved knows how hard it's going to be to deal with the aftermath. So given that there was that built-in benefit of the doubt and things came out the way that they did, I think you just have to ask yourself, man, what could lead to that? You know, 
And I'm not even I'm not even going to fill that in. I just think just put those things together and now fill it in on your own. And what makes common sense? Well, things must not have been going very good, you know, and, and I saw, you know, some some comments in the in the chat about, you know, Dane Fife's recruiting success at Michigan State. And absolutely, there was a lot of success at Michigan State recruiting wise and getting players from Indiana. But, you know, frankly, things are a little bit different now, even than they were two or three years ago. And I, I think, you know, to your guys point about who you have to get, I mean, I think you have to get someone whose mindset is on board with where college basketball is. And that means you can't really have opinions that are hostile to NIL, you know, or to other things that are important to recruits these days. Um, and it, you know, I think it's, it's well known that, uh, you know, the Dane was taken off one of the recruitments of a, of a key Indiana recruit. And you, know, you can't have that um, if he's the guy that's recruiting Indiana. But I think, Galen, to your point, you know, it would be really nice to have someone who does have some of those connections in the Midwest, you know, in, in state, um, if you can. So it certainly doesn't need to be an IU guy. Um, but I think that would that would certainly be important. Um, all right. Is there anything else on this topic that we should hit? I mean, obviously, at some point, Ryan will be here and, and talk about it. And, you know, I don't know what he plans to say or, you know, or talk about, um, you know, when he does. I can hear the fear building in your voice already. <laughs> Jared, I, I just want to make it, it public. I'm not entering the transfer portal. I'm not putting my name in uh, to Coach Woodson for the opening. Uh, I, I am staying put here at the assembly call. Okay, good. That's As I told you statement. before, we weren't even going to let you be interviewed unless you would <laughs> commit to doing a weekly show. Uh, for the I have been meeting. for a couple of years now. Uh, yeah, I know. You got to keep it going. Um, look, we'll have more to talk about on this. Who knows? Details may come out. Obviously, Indiana is going to hire somebody. You know, I would assume that Dane Fife is going to make a next move. You know, who who knows where that's going to be? So there'll be more to talk about on it. But I think you know, today has been about the raw reaction and I understand why the reaction has been so raw. And, you know, one thing I would say is, you know, if it has seemed like, like maybe my reaction to it is, uh, I don't know, not, uh, I'll put it this way. This is something that I was kind of thinking might happen for a while. So had kind of had some time to process it but I'm still really disappointed about the fact that it didn't work out with Dane Fife because he's an IU guy and really respect everything that Dane did as a player and that he's done as a coach in his career. So it absolutely, there's no joy or happiness or, or any of that in this, you know, in this happening at all. I just think it's something that like I had kind of been processing for a little while that might have happened. And so my reaction to it wasn't as raw, but I understand why a lot of the reaction to it is raw. I would just really urge people to kind of sit back and think about what makes the most sense in this case. Remove what maybe you wanted to happen or the shock part of it and just say, man, how could things have gotten to this point? You know, and I think even without concrete details, when you add it up that way, you know, it, it tells a compelling story on its own. Um, any other thoughts from you guys? Just disappointed like you and, and wish that it had worked out and it didn't. So let's all move on because at this point, it's um, there's a lot that's going to happen in the next month and a half. I mean, you think about what happened um, even last year in this month and a half period. Obviously, there was the hire, but everything else, the players almost leaving and not and guys getting hired. So, uh, you know, certainly I think percolate on a little bit. I have a sneaking suspicion uh, we'll hear a little bit more about this in the next couple of weeks in one form or another. And, and so things will play out. But at this point, it is what it is. And um, we I'm curious to see what the next chapter of IU basketball looks like as far as what the coaching staff is comprised of. Dis disappointment is the word. I know when stuff started leaking out throughout the year, um, I was in a situation where maybe a lot of people are today. No, nah, this can't be true. You know, uh, that, you know, hoping that these were just rumors coming from someone who had an agenda uh, that that things weren't well w with the coaching staff. And you want to deny it because you liked Coach Fife and uh, and what he did for Indiana and what he meant with his toughness and all of that. And you can still appreciate those things about him as a player. And I would wish uh, Indiana fans would. It just didn't work out in this 
staff uh, in this go around here at, at IU. So I, I can sense a, a lot of disappointment and that's the key word and that's okay. And then let's just be energized about who coach Woodson can bring in and, and keep Indiana moving forward. Yep. Okay. Coming up here in our third and final segment, we'll talk about Christian Lander entering his name in the transfer portal, which I think people expected, but now it's here. And what does that mean? Uh, and then we've got some questions, so we'll go through a few of those in our mailbag segment as well. Stick with us on the assembly call. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully we handled that in a way that was satisfactory. <laughs> I mean, I think so. But maybe people disagree, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, say, it's just, I will, I will just... say this. I, I, I hope everybody pumps the brakes because I've seen a lot of speculation about other members of the staff uh, maybe being on their way out. And it's not everything has like a multi stage uh, element to it. It's, it, it, this, this is, I think, very likely just an isolated thing. So I, I just be careful if I were out in the audience of going too far um, to you know, like going overboard with thinking that this is some kind of larger issue. I, and it may, it, it certainly could be, but I just don't think it is. And you yeah. got Jay Horry here talking trash in the chat. Spill the beans, you cowards. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, I, I, I apologize. I, I uh, erroneously retweeted a, a fake account on Max Christie transferring from Michigan State. So um, that that apparently is not happening. So don't oh. get don't get. Yeah, too and I don't think Andre Curbelo is either. Actually, I think that might have been a. I didn't. I mean, now we got to look out for like fake accounts, fake transfer, transfer portal information. The problem is every single one is believable. <laughs> like, is there any player in college basketball that you wouldn't believe it if it said they were transferring? Like who would okay? Who would be the most surprising player to see show up in the transfer portal? There's a question for you. Mm. The most surprising player to see show up in the transfer portal. I mean, maybe Anthony Leal actually, <laughs> <laughs> but even him, you know, you could say, well, a guy that doesn't get a lot of playing time, entering his upperclassmen seasons, even that. You mean in the be... NCAA or from Indiana? No, yeah, just in the NCAA. Who would be the most shocking name to see show up in the transfer portal? Great question, actually. Yeah, I'm going to go with Leal, and I even don't think that his would be shocking just because well, of, you know, it, it wouldn't be because Juzang of him. from UCLA? Ju didn't he? He transferred once, though, didn't he, from Kentucky? I don't even know oh, if he, he could did. transfer. <laughs> <laughs> Probably one of the Houston guys, frankly, because that, that seems like a group of players that isn't interested in going anywhere. So, yeah, that would be my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Am I not allowed to bring up Houston on the podcast? Is that a problem? No, we can bring up Houston. That's okay. all. We're we're so far past that now. See, we are so many like weird coaching stories and scandals past that. That I think Galen. Then you, you get it. to a situation about Houston where I got to talk really well about Coach Sampson, and then everyone in the chat mob hates hates me. I, and if I, I bring know. up other coaches I like, then I, know. I get just ripped to shreds. So um, yeah, we're not talking Houston. This is why you Some, just. You got to click the private chat button, Coach. So that way <laughs> yeah. you don't even see the comments. So you don't just don't know. It's very blissful. Someone said one of Fran's kids from Iowa. Would that really shock you to know I, that someone I mean, who spent their whole life with Fran would want to get away? <laughs> who was the coach that whose kid transferred? It was it was it was a foot. Oh, it was uh, Todd Graham who got fired by Hawaii, uh, <laughs> the football coach. But like the week before he got fired, his kid put. His name in the transfer portal to transfer out of Hawaii. So that no, I don't think that Fran's kids transferring would be that big of a shock. <laughs> you know who'd be the biggest shock to transfer? Jordan Bohannon. That would be the biggest surprise. <laughs> I, I don't even think that guy's allowed to leave the state of Iowa at this point, is no, he? No. No. Yeah, I mean it, it really is. It really is a great question. Because the answer is I'm not sure. I'm just not sure anybody would be that surprising, you know, if they transferred outside of just like maybe a hometown kid that grew up dreaming of playing for the school. You know, hmm. interesting. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's hit segment three. We'll talk Lander, and we'll hit a few. I need to go through some of these questions and see which ones are the most relevant for this week, and we'll save the rest for next week. Um, but yeah, we'll hit a few of these. Perry Ellis. <laughs> Perry Ellis. 
<laughs> you know what? I'll, I'll, the networks have to ban shirtless coach celebrations. I don't oh want to see Musselman without gosh. a shirt. I don't want to see Samson without a shirt. Oh, come on. I mean, <laughs> like when we win, the NC, when we get to the Sweet 16, I'm going to come on a podcast with no shirt on. No one <laughs> wants right. to see that. Great. Okay. Pour water well, on well, myself. Yes. <laughs> When you guys when you guys win your next bracketology, that should be the celebration. Yeah, when <laughs> we got to get a little more seeds right. <laughs> it's still very raw, Galen. Well, too soon. Well, I might have been I might have been eighty seven, been shirtless down at the fountain. Now that I think about it, so oh, yes, there were a I lot of people so. shirtless down at the fountain. If I also remember <laughs> right, yes, I believe there were. Beautiful night. It was a beautiful night. We need to have another one of those. We do, we do. Okay, here we go. Hey, it's Romeo Langford. What's the only thing better than hand a game winner to beat Wisconsin? Celebrate it with friends afterwards. Join Jared, Andy, Ryan, and Coach on the assembly call after every IU basketball game. Go Hoosers. Thank you, Romeo. Good luck down in San Antonio. Uh, you are listening to the Assembly Call. I'm Jared Morris here with Galen Clavio and Coach Brian Tonsoni. And we just spent a good 45 minutes talking about the Dane Fife story, you know, our initial reactions to it, thoughts on it. Um, so if you're catching us late, um, you can go back and listen to that. And obviously we'll have more to talk about on that as we go through the offseason. But there was another big story that, you know, in a normal week would probably headline an episode all of its own. And I want to talk about that here off the top of this segment before we get into our mailbag. And that is a former five star recruit announcing that he is going into the transfer portal. And that is Christian Lander. Uh, and if memory serves, Christian put his name into the transfer portal last year. And then, you know, once the um, firing of Archie Miller was announced and then eventually pulled it back. Uh but it's a different, I think, you know, context with him doing it now this year after another year of kind of seeing him play. And really, you know, despite, I think, what is obvious talent in terms of vision and passing ability and just general athleticism, you know, really has struggled, struggled this year for the second straight year, Galen, to put it together into any type of meaningful and consistent production on the court. And so, you know, there's two senses I got today from Christian's announcement and then from the reaction from IU fans. One from his announcement, I don't if maybe if one of you guys has it, you can pull it up. It, it's just sounded very definitive um, that he's, you know, putting it into the transfer portal and he's planning on leaving. Um, he even had a tweet afterwards, you know, thanking his brothers, you know, and all that stuff. Um, and by the way, he was named academic all big 10 earlier today, too. So, you know, he is certainly a guy, you know, who has you know, I think done a lot of things right at Indiana, you know, hasn't, hasn't been an, an issue um, in a lot of senses. Um, but the other sense that I got Galen from fans is this is probably the right move um, and wishing him well and hoping that he, you know, does well wherever he goes, but I don't sense a lot of regret or fear or disappointment. It's just more like, Hey, we all gave this two years. It's just not working. Hopefully X is back. We've got Jalen Hood Shafino coming in. We may have Rob Finnessy back for another year. You got Gabe Cups coming after that. It really is more like where does Christian fit right now? And while I think, you know, Indiana fans really wanted this to happen a lot and feel no ill will toward him leaving, this seems like the right this seems like why the 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 transfer portal rule and the immediate eligibility uh, rule is a good thing. For a guy like Christian, it seems like a really good thing. Yeah, it just it wasn't going to work. It hadn't worked. It was it was kind of baffling how unproductive he was throughout his entire time. He had one double figure scoring game in in the two years that he was at IU. He barely played this year. Now, a lot of that we think was due to injury, although it's kind of hard to know when the injuries stopped and just the inability to have a spot to put him into a game started. And look, it's a shame because five-star recruit reclassifier, you know, was seemed to be like, okay, maybe the Archie era will be all right because he was able to land this kid and bring him in. But from the moment, really, he he came in, you just never got the sense watching him that he fit at this level of basketball. And I don't really understand why he wasn't ranked a five-star for no reason. 
Uh, you know, he obviously has talent. He obviously has potential or had potential, but that never materialized once he started playing at the college level. And look, I, I think we've seen a lot of players. If you watch enough college basketball, we see players like this every year. We just don't normally see them at Indiana come in so heralded. And then, I mean, this isn't even like a Romeo Langford thing where he comes in and the rain is disappointing but he still plays at a level that's good enough to get him drafted. Like this was like he came in and just never really was able to contribute. And certainly the coaching change didn't help. Um, and certainly I think the five-star rating and the reclassification and coming in a year early certainly didn't help because he obviously needed a lot more physical structure to him to be able to uh, do what he needed to do at this level. So I, I I'm disappointed that it ends this way without us ever having seen him get anywhere close to not even the, the, the ceiling, but even really the floor of what you thought you might get out of a Christian lander. Um, and I wish him the best moving forward. Um, and, and I don't know where that's going to be. That's probably the thing I'm most curious about with Christian lander is where does he end up? Like what, what level does he land at and what is he able to do once he's there? I think he could be a really fascinating story during whatever remaining time he has playing college basketball. Yeah, he's not a coach. He's not an Al Durham or an Armand Franklin that's going to make, you know, that had, you know, kind of skins on the wall as a college player and is going to make a lateral move and be a productive player right away. That would make no sense at all, given what we saw. But he does seem like a guy that could really benefit from going down a level, um, you know, and, and playing at a different level of athleticism and hopefully just get, he just seems like a guy that needs playing time. You know, and hopefully he can get that, maybe going to a lower level and then seeing what he can develop into. Yeah, you know, he just probably mistake of reclassifying hurt um hurt Christian the most. And then, you know, two coaches didn't play him. Ultimately, that's the question. That that's the thing that I will lead on. Our Archie didn't feel comfortable playing him a lot, and then Coach Woodson wanted him to stay around because of, of that. And the other thing is that um, I think what Galen said about we don't usually see those top recruits come in and then struggle uh, like he did. It happens all the time. Uh, you know, sometimes those recruiting uh, numbers don't, you know, don't really pan out or the difference between the, the four star and the five star, you know, we all, we've all loved the, the three stars that have blossomed and gone on to be drafted and those types of things. I, I just think, um, and sometimes with, with young players, they, they success is tough. And when you're a five-star and you get recruited early, then you, you think you've arrived and, and you got to have a setback, got to have some failure before you really learn that you, you got to go back and, and do some work, that this game takes a lot of work. And those, those people who are the most successful at a variety of colleges, it takes a lot of work. And it just seemed like it didn't match with Archie and it didn't match with Coach Woodson. And both guys were really uh, strong on, you know, you got to get it done off season. You got to get it, it done. And, and so hopefully uh, my hope for Christian is that he, he learned what he needs to do to get back to that five-star level if he can get back and he needs to find the appropriate spot to do it. And, and, and we wish him well. But this, this probably needed to happen. And, and you know, we got to get used to it. There's going to be more. Uh, and that doesn't mean speak badly of a coaching staff or anything. It's just, um, you know, uh, you got to take each one individually. But this one, this one was bound to happen. And wasn't, if I recall correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think like even his, 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 his evaluation as a recruit was strange because he earned the five star label kind of early. And then wasn't like one of the sessions, maybe the summer session or something canceled because of COVID or something. So people never really got to see him again, kind of play up a level at the next age group. And so he kind of carried that five star forward. But there was a huge gap of evaluation that wasn't able to happen when Didn't a he? lot of times there's a big fluctuation as players you know, change and evolve. So I think there was something there, you know, that, you know, maybe if there had kind of been more evaluation, you know, maybe he doesn't stay with that five star maybe there's not as much hype and maybe you're more patient with a guy like that and maybe he's more patient he it got just... invited he he got sorry he got invited to that olympic tryout thing and did really well out there and i don't know what timing is you're talking about the timing of the recruitment but i know that was we were all excited about seeing that tape and uh and we got those videos uh that really showed that he could play with the highest level 
that's always your concern too, that, okay, yeah, you have really good success in AAU and all the shoe, you know, things that go on. That's been a benefit lately of AAU. You're playing against better competition, but I think you might be right that um, some of that uh, occurred. And, And again, when you evaluate in those situations, it's a lot different than playing in the Big Ten. Uh, and, and and sometimes the, yeah. the AAU circuit, you could be a stud and a star there, but then you come into a physical league, uh, it, it could be a difference. And I think that's just what happened um, with Lander. Yeah, and his outside shot just never developed. I mean, he's a guy, he only took 16 free throws, but he made 13 of them. That's 81%. So it's not like he was broken as a shooter, but he certainly was broken as an outside shooter. Um, and that just really hurt him because, yeah. you know, no one respected his shot and just made it hard for him. But I, I think we all guard. agree. Yeah, well, that was obviously a big thing, too, <laughs> obviously. Um, but we wish him well um, and certainly we'll be cheering him on wherever he, wherever he goes next. Um, OK, guys, let's hit a couple of these questions. Uh, we'll start with some questions from our Assembly Call community discord. Uh, and members of our private Discord who ask questions, uh, actually, they receive our community coin home uh, when they ask a question as a little bonus. Uh, we'll be talking about that more this offseason. So just uh, stay on the lookout for that. Um, but a couple interesting questions here. They were interesting before, and I think they're even more interesting now, given the context of today. Uh, one is from Tom W. So he says, how do you think Woodson will approach this offseason differently than last year? considering he now has a full year of college coaching experience under his belt. Well, I think we saw the first way he's going to approach it differently, which is he is taking control of his staff. <laughs> and that's a, you know, a pretty important thing for him to kind of take control of, especially now that he's been through this thing for a, a full year. So that's the obvious one. What other, what else do you guys think in terms of how he'll approach this differently? Well, I think the first thing is probably, well, I can't say for certain until we get to like May and we know who the roster is going to be for the off season. But I think that one of the things that was obvious to me was this team kind of had almost a fake camaraderie. It looked like at the beginning of the year. And then when things got tough, it seemed to fall apart a bit. And then they managed to come together at the very end. And we saw that in, uh, in the big 10 tournament and, and certainly in that Wyoming game. And I think Woodson learned some things about what team cohesion is all about at the college level and how it might be different from the pro level where guys are coming in and doing their jobs on a day-to-day basis uh, as opposed to needing to be motivated to do X, Y, or Z. So I think that might be the first thing. Last year, you you know didn't even have the full coaching staff put together until mid-May. I don't think they got the final – Uh, you know, thumbs up on who all was going to be on the roster until the end of May or something like that. And so that didn't really give them much of a platform to do anything other than just start at the basics. Well, now that's in place. You've obviously got a defensive identity, so you can build off of that. There's a lot of structure you can build on top of. Now it's a matter of continuing to get that team cohesion up. I think that's probably the first thing I would expect him to do, because I think you could tell, at least I could tell um, in his in his press conference comments and things of that nature, he was really starting to hone in on togetherness and guys feeling like they were a part of something bigger than themselves. And I don't know that he could even really spend a lot of time focusing on that because he was so busy at the beginning, along with the rest of his staff, just trying to get them to understand what they were trying to do. Mm. Coach, what do you think? Number one. And and I think it was mentioned on a show today that um, it's recruiting. Uh, recruiting guys to fit his style, whether you, you, you like the style of the middle ball screen and that post up and, and that kind of stuff, the NBA kind of stuff that he does or not, he needs better players, better shooters, better athletes in order to fill those spots. And, and I think he's done that with this recruiting class. And it'll be interesting to see what he does in the transfer portal. Uh, you know, get it, get some shooters that could also shot fake and drive and be driving threats. I, I think he knows that now that, that uh, what he tried to do with the roster that he had um, created the 93rd most efficient offense in the NCAA, which is the fourth worst IU offense since 2002. And two of those years were the, the first two years of the Crean era. So I, I think it comes down to Jimmy's and Joe's. You need to get more athletic. And I, you saw that with Geronimo and Galloway. And, and then when Rob came back, his ability to guard, at least on the defensive end, 
those athletes uh, helped Indiana play better down the stretch from the Wisconsin game. So he's got to really be good, I think, in that uh, portal. And he learned that lesson that it, it, you can't just have stand still shooters in the corners in the collegiate game um, because there's so many different defenses that, that aren't in the NBA because of the rules. And, and then that – uh, athleticism and better shooters and better players leads to he's going to have to really evaluate what they do on offense and, and and how much they call plays versus letting the point guard play and do some of those because like like you said this season was good it was a step in the right direction but it's a floor season uh, and, and the number one area uh, just statistically that has to be improved is the offense whether that's again the better players just make his system better or he's got to morph his system a little bit more to a collegiate. I think he's got to be open to that. And he and his staff have to work really hard uh, this summer in developing that, working the players out and putting that in. He said he was going to work on defense and let the offense take care of itself. And, and that showed with outstanding defense this year, this year, I think it's got to be more offensive centered because that defense should carry from year to year. And this question is somewhat related to that, but let's see if you guys have maybe different takes on it than what we just covered. This is from elbows in. What assumptions do you think Woodson made about college basketball before his first season, and did he learn from any of them? I'll go real quick. I think he just assumed that the players um, might have been a little bit better um, than what they were. Uh, and that's easy. That's an easy, uh, I think, an easy assumption to make. He's coming from the NBA where 1 through 12 can all do something. The 12th man on the roster who dresses that night can go out there and drop 20. Uh, and I think the depth of, of his roster, um, maybe that was some of the subbing things that we've all discussed. And, and I think especially with the offense uh, giving so much control to a point guard, when, when, when that started to change, Indiana started to play better and had a top 50 offense, I think, during that stretch. So I think the assumption was that uh, the, the players might have been a little bit better uh, and their IQ and their understanding of the game and their ability of the game was a little bit higher uh, than, than – than maybe what he found out once he he got here. That that would be my guess. Um, I'll kind of – it's a slightly different version of the same thing that you just said, Coach. And I think it's – I think he expected that if he put players who had skills in particular roles, that they would be able to carry out the roles consistently and that everything would work as a system. Uh, and that didn't happen. Uh, you know, I, I think all the way down to the end of the season – IU found success at the tail end of things, essentially when they junked that and just focused entirely on the point guard and Trace Jackson Davis and, and those two roles kind of being the most important things, uh, at least offensively. Um, and, and I think that there was some naivete just in general about how offense can work. And with this particular group, you know, as we've talked about on Crimson Cast quite a bit throughout the course of the season, this was kind of a mismatched group of people offensively. And you know, it's it's tough because defensively they did gel pretty well this year. You know, the the two games at the end of the season that kind of blew their defensive numbers out of the water we were a little unfortunate because this won't be a top 20 Ken Palm defense when it's all said and done, but it really was. The St. Mary's game and the Iowa game kind of blew that up. Uh, but I do think that Woodson was a bit naive in terms of how he set the offense up and how it was going to work. And I did see some some changes towards the end that made me – uh, more optimistic about what he'll learn out of that coming in the next year. Yeah. I mean, it really, it's almost, you know, one of the best things to take from this season is that we built a top 20 defense with Parker Stewart and Miller cop who no one would consider, you know, great individual defenders or great athletes starting and playing significant minutes. You know, now you had good defenders coming off the bench and Rob Finnessy and Trey Galloway and Jordan Geronimo. But even by the end of the season, I think even Miller Cop and Parker Stewart's biggest critics were kind of begrudgingly forced to admit, man, those guys actually are playing decent defense. You know, like, yeah, they can get burned in certain matchups, but man, they really compete and they play hard. And, you know, the team defense seems to be good. And what I hope is, is the lesson that gets taken from that, to your point, coach, is we've got to prioritize offensive guys guys who can shoot and or score, and those are two different things, but bring those guys in and fit them into a defensive system. Now, you got to have – there's certain prerequisites you need for length 
And you're probably going to need, you know, a guard or two that are particularly good at putting pressure, you know, on the ball and a guy with some shot blocking instincts. You do have to recruit some defensive skill, but around your wings, look at what a lot of the really good teams do. They recruit good offensive players and try and fit them into a defensive system. And if that's what Woody kind of, you know, spent this first year building and then also, you know, working a point guard through some of those early struggles, but now we're going to be far ahead of that next season then I think this program is really has a chance to be ready to take a big step forward um, next year. So, you know, hopefully that is a, a lesson that gets taken and we can benefit from it. Uh, let's just hit a couple more questions here. Cause we've already been going for almost 90 minutes. Uh, I want to Galen, I want to ask you this question from Phil uh, who says, what does the NCAA have against IU evidence? IU football hosed on bowl game. IU men's basketball underseeded, forced to start in Dayton, only allowed to wait for an undersized plane so they could arrive at four o'clock in the morning in Portland to play a game on dead legs. IU women's basketball gets to play in Bridgeport, 20 miles from the UConn campus. NCAA conveniently allocates 100 tickets per school, remainder to be purchased by locals months ago. IU women will face hostile crowd and legendary opponent. Thanks, NCAA, for nothing. Well, uh, a, are these fair grievances, and is it at all worthwhile for Indiana to? kind of play this this victim card or feel like a victim or is this just do we just need to move past this and not and not worry about this i think a few of those are fair grievances others are not the ncaa does not pick bowl games they don't bowl bowl uh bowls pick bowl games in concert with conferences if you want to bitch about iu getting put in the outback bowl you got to go to the big 10 uh just just get a picture of gary barda and throw some darts at it um which you really should be doing anyway uh you know the iu women thing is interesting because the i think the more aggrieved party at this point is north carolina state who despite being the number one seed is essentially going to have to play a road game if they beat Notre dame and have to play uconn of course they won't play uconn because indiana is going to beat uconn um it is a hostile environment, but you know this is this is how college basketball on the men's side used to be, where you would end up in somebody else's home arena, uh, and IU has benefited from that. IU hosted games in '81, you know, in that tournament run. So, um, to some degree, I guess I can't get too upset about that. I will say, the travel arrangements, the overall setup for the men's team going into the tournament, uh, I, we we've said on several occasions was ridiculous. Uh, the NCAA got what they wanted out of it. They got the highest rated um, first four game in history in that Indiana-Wyoming game because Indiana was playing in the game, and, and we know that Indiana is going to draw a big crowd. You're um, right. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, look, I, I think the worst thing IU can do is play the victim card because when you play the victim card, you become Purdue, and you don't ever want that. And so, you know, you, you have to look at these things and say, okay, fine, do that. Go ahead. We'll remember this when we're a one seed or a two seed or, or you know, or what have you. And that none of that stuff matters. Uh, so, as look, and I, people, I love to bash on the NCAA as much as anybody else does, but I just don't think it does the program a whole lot of good. I think football is a great example. Football got real sour about that Outback Bowl to the point that they took the Big Ten patches off the uniform that looked pretty silly uh, when they turned around and went two and ten the next year. So it's best just to take the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and uh, use them as motivation as opposed to stewing in your juices. Yes. By the Agreed. way, I am I am enjoying some of the drive by people in the chat who are showing up for the first time today, and uh, Coach, you know, saying that we are apologists for Woodson and his staff and carrying their water it's like okay these people did not listen to the show <laughs> all all season long um but welcome we we enjoy that you're here and we hope that you will become uh sensible members of the chat mob moving forward so we can always use more sensible and responsible members of the chat mob um all right couple more quick questions from kevin who needs to take a big step up next season assuming i you gets nothing in the transfer portal who are the two? So just assume that that there aren't like, you know, some big new score or like kind of an impact guy that we're kind of filling in around the edges in the transfer portal of guys that you expect to stay um, and that could play a prominent role. Who do you think is the most important to take a big step up between this season and the next season? Uh, uh, I think coach it's go first down to two. Um, 
Bates and Geronimo. Uh, I, I think Geronimo's got untapped potential with his athleticism and his ability to shoot. Uh, and, and if he works on his drive game and his handles, uh, I think he can guard. So I think the success of the IU team, if, if the two seniors who graduated and now Lander's gone and the three recruits come in, uh, the biggest step up that would help um, is, is Geronimo with Bates being a second for me because you think you need that closer score. Um, since we I have to, at this point, assume everybody's staying under the rules that you've just provided, I'll also give two, but they're two different people from, from who coach gave. One of them is, uh, definitely Trey Galloway, who is, is got to develop an outside shot. He cannot shoot 21% from three and, and play meaningful minutes for this team. I mean, as much as he provides in terms of spark and energy, uh, his offensive, rating his offensive efficiency was real bad this year his assist rate was not particularly good and he wasn't shooting the ball from outside he scored a lot of points on drives but as much as that was useful in a couple of games we saw the hard ceiling on that style of play the other guy is miller cop miller cop has all of the tools needed to be an effective swingman outside shooter uh defender and he just did not really live up to that throughout the course of the season. Um, you know, I mean, he started off really strong, but really slumped badly. Uh, you know, I had a couple of good games at the end, and I, I was certainly, I think, pleased to see that. But I think if Cop plays to the level that he seems to be capable of playing when we've seen him at his best, that's maybe three more wins in the regular season for Indiana this year, just from hitting shots that are wide open on the outside. So those would be my two at this point. And, and certainly I think, yes, uh, you know, Geronimo and, and Bates would be players that need to, to definitely make a big step up, particularly if they don't get anybody in in the portal, which I think they will. But uh, those would be the two guys I would identify at this point. And he's kind of the forgotten guy in a lot of these offseason conversations. But it makes a lot more sense for him to come back to Indiana next year than really any other outcome because he's already transferred, so he can't. Now, I guess, could he potentially grad transfer somewhere and not have to sit out a year? I mean, I don't know how that would work. Not, all these rules are being made yeah. up on the fly. Like all it <laughs> I takes, don't even know. All it takes is one threatened lawsuit and the, the rules just change, you know? So that's essentially what happened with name, image, and likeness. So, yeah. 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 But I, you know, look, I don't, I, I don't think that you'll get Miller Cop and Jordan Geronimo back them playing in their same roles. Because I think the way that you're going to get Jordan Geronimo back is either Trace or Race, because Jordan Geronimo has potential, and he needs to play, and he knows it, and everybody around him knows it, and if he were to come back and be the seventh man here, I wouldn't even want him here. I'd feel bad, right? So if Jordan Geronimo is going to come back, he's going to be in a prominent role, and that role is probably playing the four, and I just don't think that you're really going to go into next season with Miller Kopp as your three. It seems like he might be more in like a, a Colin Hartman role, coming off at the bench, being a shooter, and I'll tell you, and maybe we'll end with this, because I think you guys, I mean, I think, you know, frankly, all of you guys are right with everything that you just said. And for this program, to take a big step forward. I think those four guys need to be here and need to be prominent parts of the solution next season. I think the other biggest lingering question, I mean, number one, is X staying or not? I think, again, for Xavier Johnson, if you just play it out, like as I played out with Trace, for example, it just it makes more sense for me that he'll go. Now, I think there's a chance that he'll stay. I'd love to have him back. I think it makes sense for him to go. Race, it seems like it's, I don't know, maybe 50-50. But, you know, when a guy goes through his senior speech and kind of says some of the things he does, it seems like he might go. You know, and I think you, it could make some sense, even if he just wants a taste of college basketball elsewhere, you know, like Al Durham got this year. Um, but Xavier Johnson, to me, he's already transferred. He's not an NBA guy yet, and but perhaps with another really good season, he could get on those radars. He spent this whole year going through the cauldron of playing for Mike Woodson and came out on the other end playing his best basketball and the offense kind of humming. It makes sense for him to stay. And if he stays, now your biggest question is, how does Xavier Johnson and Jalen hood Shafino coexist? Because if Xavier Johnson is staying, he's staying to start. And if Jalen Huchifino is coming to Indiana, he's coming to Indiana to start and play minutes. So there's a couple things. You know, number one, Jalen Huchifino not really known as like a knockdown outside shooter. 
So can those two guys who really need the ball in their hand coexist? And there's a couple of things I've thought about, Coach. Is one, you know, if you can play each one of those guys, let's say you play them 30 minutes. You play them 20 together. You give each of them 10 minutes when the other one's not on there. So they get some time with the ball in their hands alone. Some of that time is spent together. Um, but you're always, you always have either a fifth year starter or a five star point guard leading your offense. And at times you have two ball handlers who can attack a defense in a different way than Indiana has had. You know, and looking at the numbers on synergy, Xavier Johnson this year shot 42% on catch and shoot threes, guarded and unguarded. And that's the one thing that he showed this year. If that can carry forward, and he was inconsistent doing this at Pittsburgh, so there is a chance that those numbers dip down. But if he can be a guy that can play off ball a little bit because he can make those catch and shoot threes, and if you can get those two guys on the court, that's a really interesting way to attack, especially if you have a three-man who can be you know, a shooter or someone who can score. It really starts to make the offense look interesting next year, Coach. Um, with those two guys and what you might be able to do with them. And I'm not so sure that they can't play together. Yeah, you saw some of that when, when X and Rob um, played together, uh, where you, you had you know two point guards uh, out on the floor, and, and now you, you would have two outstanding uh, point guards out on the floor. That's something that Coach Woodson's going to have to figure out. Can they both play together, and what does that mean? One of the things that – Hood Shafino has is some size at, at six, four, six, five, he can probably guard the two, uh, and, and he can do some things. And the, the interesting thing for me is that second side driver. Uh, I've mentioned that comment all the time, uh, with Parker and, and with cop, you didn't have that. So when X would drive, if he didn't have the lob or a shot himself and he kicks out, it was either a three or they're going to have to reset because those guys really couldn't get downhill. When you have two guards that can really go places, uh, I'd be interested to see what Coach Woodson can come up with offensively uh, to, to, to attack. That there, There's some intrigue there for me as what you can do from an offensive standpoint. As uh, There's so many things. We call it zero action where you dribble at the top and hand off on the run. Now you have one point guard going to the other point guard. You can keep that. Um, I think there's some things where you can have multiple drivers. I think that's when you saw Galloway and X play together. Um, Galloway wasn't a shooter. But he went downhill. And, and the key is Coach Woodson needs to get guys, at least three guys who can get downhill. When we had two guys that could go downhill, Indiana's offense got better all of a sudden, even if we had Galloway not performing offensively to you know the highest efficiency or whatever. But just the threat of catch, drive, drive, catch, th those things intrigue me. I think that's more collegiate basketball. That's more of that part of that getting those athletes out. So I wouldn't be surprised – uh, obviously, if X is here and, and Hood Shafino's here, you're going to have to play them together because you're not yes. going to sit Hood Shafino and only play him 10 minutes because X has got to play uh, major, major minutes. So I, I think that's a given that he's going to have to find some way to play those guys together. Yeah. And, you know, I know some people, you know, wondered, is, is Hood Shafino going to start? Is he going to play? Who knows if he's going to start? He's going to play 25 to 28 minutes, I bet. And I don't say that just because, you know, like you just look at his game. He has kind of a college ready game because he's got a, you know, a good sturdy body. The outside shot really isn't there, but he defends well. He's just kind of a smart, high IQ player. To me, he just profiles as a kind of guy that Woody's not going to not going to want to keep off the court because of some of the things he brings. Now, you know, who knows? It's a freshman. And sometimes, you know, those guys, you know, don't adjust as you think that they will. But if those two guys are coming back, it certainly seems like worthwhile conversations to have how they'll project together. I just, I, the one thing I, I think we have a tendency to do is significantly overrate the level of contribution that a lot of these, the relatively highly touted players that I use had come in in the past are actually able to make. And, and I think that to some degree, it's been to the detriment of the program that, you know, they we've asked young players to do as much as they've been asked to do and they haven't always been able to do it. Um, I look, I, I would be, I think at this point, surprised if Xavier Johnson left, if he does, I feel like that really sets the project back quite a ways because I, I just don't think there's anybody, including Jalen Hood Shafino, that's going to be able to come in and take the reins. And I'm not saying, I mean, certainly the offense wasn't perfect and, and the team wasn't playing perfect, but there was an attitudinal adjustment with the team with Xavier Johnson in that role at the end of the season that is my biggest source of optimism for this upcoming year. And so that's, look, 
get a lot of good pieces, put them together, and let things sort out on their own in terms of who's actually getting the minutes, that's the competition level Indiana needs. I, I just feel like we've, for so long, with IU basketball, you've had such a shallow field depth in terms of talent that we, it, fans get kind of diluted, media get a bit diluted about how good the team actually is, and there's this huge drop-off compared to what you get in the rest of the conference, and that's why you end up, you know, missing the tournament five years in a row and, and almost missing it a sixth year in a row. So yeah. um, that's that to me is the biggest thing at this point. And I'm curious how the other new parts come in. But I think Woodson's going to have to really take a hard look at this roster and say, look, as, as, as much of an accomplishment as this year was in terms of getting over the finish line, so to speak, it also wasn't good enough. And the team statistically deteriorated over the last half of the season. They were 11 and 12 from January 1st until the end of the season. That's the kind of thing that has to, to change. And I think that only comes with cycling in talent that can keep you at a higher level throughout the course of the year. Yeah, no, it's a great point. And I think the best thing for Jalen hood Shafino is for Xavier Johnson to stay. Even if on the surface it might seem like, oh, okay, there's going to be Less usage for him, but the pressure is taken off because Xavier Johnson is that guy. Fans trust him. Seems crazy to say after how things went the first couple months of the season, but IU fans trust and really admire Xavier Johnson for what he does. And so I hope he comes because I think that'll allow Jalen Hutcherfino to settle in because, um, you know, he's going to play, allow him to settle in and kind of pick his spots um, to not have all that pressure as a freshman. And then he can hopefully take over uh, the year after. Okay, very last question. This is from Joel. Where does Grace Berger fit in the annals of IU basketball lore? Not a great shooter from deep, but she knows how to score the ball, and if they need a bucket, the moment is never too big. Very few players have the killer instinct she possesses, and I'm hard-pressed to find her comparison in both uh, IU women's basketball or IU men's basketball. Galen, do you have a Grace Berger player comp from the annals of IU basketball on either side, men or women? No, she's, way, really, she's such a phenomenal player to watch. She is so much fun to watch. She is, and she's also just a very unique player, um, just in, yeah. in how the, the particular package that she brings to the table. And, you know, I think with – with um, it's tough trying to c compare men's and women's players to each other in terms of how uh, – how because the, the, the pieces are always different. You know, I think the thing with Grace Berger over her career has just been – you know, the team has gradually changed around her and the, the talent level has gradually increased. Um, but she's managed to keep a, a such a high level of, of overall play, you know, at least through the last couple of years. You know, I mean, last year was what, 15 and seven or something like that. And then the year before was um, was you know, one of the leaders in, in scoring as well in double figures. But the game has changed a bit. And in some cases, like when you start in that Princeton game, she had to take over and try to manufacture points that would lead to victory and did so and was able to rely on a teammate to play uh, stalwart defense against Princeton's best player uh, to be able to even put the team in a position to do that. And she's always had that kind of flexibility so I, I'm hard pressed to come up with a comp off the top of my head. I guess I should have looked at the question sheet before we got started, but I do think in the annals of Indiana women's basketball, that particular mix, that type of player has just not been at Indiana that often. There've been good players that have played women's basketball for Indiana, but she's one of the very few that has been both excellent offensively, but also just gritty in a way that is inspiring, not just to fans, but also I think to her teammates as well. Yeah, she's a closer. She's she is a closer. closer, man. Give her the ball. Get out of her way. Uh, do you see what Terry Morin? I don't have it ready, but someone uh, tweeted out the picture that she was real focused there in the last uh, forty seconds or so. Oh, and, yeah. and Terry Morin uh, quote tweeted that and said that, in, in essence, I'm paraphrasing that we see that face all the time. She's a winner. Um, and you know when your head coach quote tweets one is on Twitter anyway and sees that and that that's the speaks volumes for what what she means to Indiana women's basketball and it's fun to watch that you know um give me the ball in crunch time I'm, I'm gonna make it more times than I miss it it's that uh that Kobe attitude you know I, I want the ball yeah. I, I want to put it in the basket and and that's been fun to watch it is it is really hard to think of a comp the the one actually comp offensively that comes to mind 
uh, is Romeo in terms of her ability to get her mid range shot and get to the basket whenever she wants to. Now there's other parts of that where it falls apart, but she does remind me of him in that sense. Um, in you know, in those two senses, because you know, when you need it, she can always get a shot, you know, and that's a skill that we frankly haven't seen a lot. Uh, <laughs> we haven't seen that enough at Indiana in recent years. All right, guys, any final thoughts before we close up here on this uh, very strange day in Indiana basketball? I will say just everyone chill for a little bit. <laughs> I mean, that's the big thing. Look, I, I enjoy the we're rest. We're always having to tell IU basketball fans to chill. Right. <laughs> like, well, and, and maybe we're wrong. Maybe everybody should just be in full panic mode all the time, although it feels <laughs> like it's been that way for, I don't know, eight years now. So I'm not sure it's really getting uh, anybody anywhere. No, look, in all seriousness, uh, you know, today was a bit traumatic, I think, for a lot of people. There's some questions out there uh, as far as men's basketball is concerned. But I think things are going to work out okay. Uh, it was going to be kind of a weird off season anyway, because of how weird college basketball is these days uh, with so much movement and, and not knowing where players are going to be. And just the general, you know, like, should we feel good about this season? Should we not feel good about this season? And so all of that, I think, conspires to make it maybe less uh, easygoing than it would be otherwise. And, and the Fife news on, on top there is, is not exactly the cherry people were looking for, but uh I will say this, women's basketball, this is going to be a heck of a contest this weekend, and it's going to be interesting. You know, UConn showed they are not unbeatable. They almost lost to Central Florida on their home floor uh, earlier this week and and probably should have if UCF could, like, hit a free throw or if hmm. the, uh, the the officiating in the women's game was, was anywhere close to consistent. But that said um, – Indiana, and I was talking to Austin uh, Render today, who's the play-by-play broadcaster for the women's team, and, and as he said it, you know, this IU team is not going to be scared of UConn. They're not going to be intimidated by them. They beat North Carolina State uh, in the NCAA tournament last year as a one seed when they were a four, and, you know, the, playing UConn in Bridgeport is not the same as playing UConn in stores. Um, so I don't think they're going to go in there being afraid. I don't know if they're going to win, but I certainly think they've got a shot at competing hard and having a chance towards the end of the game. We'll see what happens. So that's really what I'm focused on at this point, and I think the rest of the stuff will take care of itself. Yep, well said. Coach? Yeah, you know, it's uh, always an interesting offseason, but uh, Indiana made a nice run at the end, and that's what I'm going to focus on. Uh, you know, there are some questions, as Galen said, whether this was a, a good year or a bad year. We're going to cover all of that in the offseason in, in breaking down um, – our thoughts on, on what went worked and what didn't, but it, it was just nice to be playing Saturday in the big 10 tournament. It was nice to see our name being called in the NCAA tournament. Uh, and right now, even when news like this breaks, I'm trying to maintain that focus on, we got somewhere we hadn't been for uh, a while since 2016. And these things happen uh, all the time and, and keep moving forward. We're probably going to see some more roster situations, uh, players come and leaving all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and the bottom line is it's all intended to make Indiana better. I, I do believe Coach Woodson has that in mind. Uh, I really believe in him that he wants to do well. He's not just here filling a spot for the next coach. Uh, and, and whether we agree with this move or that move, uh, I'm proud to, to have him as, as our head coach. Uh, and I, I bank on him making this better, making his decisions better. Uh, and that's just the way I'm going to try to focus on and, and eliminate some of the drama in my own head. Um, but uh, it, it happens a lot of places. But it's Indiana, and uh, it's springtime, and they, they're selling beer at the BART. Uh, and, and so, you know, there's a lot to look forward to. Uh, and that's the way I'm going to look at news like today. Absolutely. Well, the reason we did this show a day early on Wednesday instead of Thursday is there are Sweet 16 games coming Thursday and Friday, Elite Eight games coming Saturday and Sunday, and of course the IU women playing, the, the, that's the highlight, IU women playing their Sweet 16 games Saturday at 2 o'clock Eastern time. So we got our IU basketball talk done. Enjoy the rest of the basketball that you have coming up this week and surely by next week. Uh, there will be a lot more news, whether it's people in the transfer portal, assistant coaches hired or whatever is going to happen. Uh, there's going to continue to be a lot of news. We will cover it uh, for you every week on Assembly Call Radio, probably next week back at our normal time of Thursday. But keep an eye out on uh, on Twitter and we'll announce if there's any changes. But 
happy to be here talking today, even if the circumstances, uh, you know, weren't as great. Um, but, you know, let's move on and be ready to cheer the IU women on because it's, like I said at the beginning, it's one of the best basketball teams that this school has produced, and we don't know how many more games are going to have them. So let's savor them for as long as they're with us. Yes. <clears throat> and we also give a big – uh, set of well wishes to Al Durham and the Providence Friars as they Heck go. Into yes. This <laughs> Heck yes. Absolutely. Go Al and go St. Peter's. Might as well give them some well wishes. Let's pull off that upset. But by, by the way, I did enjoy Purdue put out that video with uh, Purdue Pete as Rocky. Of course, Rocky's the underdog. Right. And yes. it's just, it no. always it, it amuses me that even when they're the biggest favorite in the Sweet 16, no. Purdue is desperate to position themselves this as is, the underdog. This is, yes, this is like trying to feel sympathy <laughs> for Ivan Drago. Yeah. It's, uh, no, it's fascinating. <laughs> uh, sorry, coach. I know we're, we're dissing your program, man. <laughs> just thought it was funny. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> all right let's get out of here all right that's going to do it for us on this week's edition of the assembly call if you want to see us do the show live join us at assemblycall.com on thursday nights for the live broadcast of our assembly call radio recording thank you to bob thompson for producing the music that you hear on the show and thank you to john ringer of rig design for producing or for designing our logos and as always thank you for listening we will have a show a post game show for you saturday after the iu yukon game and hopefully another one uh, on Monday and then AC Radio next Thursday. Until then. Take it from me, Jordan Halls. Keep your elbow in and your eyes on the rim. And go Hoosiers. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. You're welcome, Coach. Thanks for giving us a reason to come out, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were coming out anyway. He just gave us more to talk about, I suppose. Yeah. All right. Well, well, good work, fellas. Yeah. Well, Thanks. What's it going to be next week? <laughs> I mean, hopefully, you know, man, you know, the other thing I was thinking, being a college basketball coach, is it seems so much harder now. I mean, between stuff like the nonsense that you have to deal with with social media and just the uncertainty of the off seasons. That's, I mean, think about all the moving pieces, parts and pieces that the staff has to think about right now. Because it's like, okay, what are Trace and Race going to do? Do we have to go target a big man? You know, are we set with, you know, that Tamar and Jordan are coming back? Do we need to, like, it's just, it's all these things and the dominoes have to start falling and they're probably never going to fall in the exact order you need them to, but you got to have contingency plans. Well, it's just, it seems like a, a lot of balls to juggle in, you, in, in a difficult way. You may be right, but the flip side is, you've got a lot of outs now if you recruit the wrong guy if well, you that's true. uh you know if you're if the style changes and you've got to make a move i mean you've got that's the thing it's it's certainly less stable in terms yes. of what you've got year to year um and but i also think it maybe keeps you a little more honest at times as a college coach because you can't just I mean, as, we, as Tom Crean has learned, again, you can't yeah. just promise guys a bunch of playing time and then not play them or, or, you know, or be unpleasant to them in practice or things like that. And, you know, people do that. They'll, they will vote with their feet, so to speak. I guess that's the thing I'm most interested in with this IU team. I mean, the Lander transfer news was not surprising. Uh, and there's a couple other guys, you know, whether they'd be early leaves or whatever, that, that would be uh, unsurprising. I'll be curious to see if anybody leaves that is surprising because, you know, if the, mm -hmm. if the question's about culture and esprit de corps and whatever, that is where I think it's a different game. But honestly, I think coaches probably needed to be better at treating players as human beings anyway, as opposed oh, yeah. to pieces on a team. And so perhaps that's a, a switch for the better, all things considered. Oh, no, to be clear, I do think it's better. I just think in terms of harder, I just meant more work. <laughs> Like there's just a lot more work to do as a college coach stuff to keep track of. And you like, you know, you can't just the season ends and maybe you go take a couple weeks off to relax. Like it just feels like there's just constant stuff to think about and worry about and do that wouldn't have been there before. Yeah. But I think it's, it's better. constant turnover it's now. And, and that's again, maybe uh, someone like Woodson is poised to do that. Who's used to free agency and roster turnover. Uh, at the NBA, bringing new guys in and getting them acclimated to the new system, that could be a uh, that could 
be a positive um, down the road too, instead of, you know, a two year, three year plan of building. Um, but I think all college coaches got to do that. You can get Galen's right. You can fix stuff a lot faster now than you could uh, ever before because of the massive amounts of people um, in, in the portal. Um, you just got to, how, how do you manage that is, is the, is the tough thing. It's like you, you get all these kids and, and they can score at a lower level and, now you got to watch, you know, you've been doing your high school recruiting for years and building relationships. And then all of a sudden someone pops up and you got a week or two to get the film on them and, and try to figure out is, is that the wing that we need? Is that the big that we need? Um, I, I, if I were doing it, I'd have someone on staff watching guys at lower levels or, or getting tape on lower level schools in case kids pop. You know, and, yeah, and that, mm-hmm. that's scary because that leads you to some tampering. Um, and I've heard schools already complaining to people are tampering with players at lower levels, um, you know, calling them midseason and saying, hey, you know, I, give give us a look at the end. Um, I guess so I, that's, that's going to be an interesting thing. But I would definitely have my files ready to go. And if kids pop, I, I kind of know where where we're we're heading in some way assign it to a ga or something yeah i mean to some degree you know it's interesting the the idea like i think about i watch a lot of european soccer like that whole setup is about the cream rising to the top and you could have a player playing at a lower level and they're able to move up and to some degree i mean yes it's it's unfair to the smaller schools only in that they don't have the ability to just lord over a good player who happened to land at their level and then blossom. Um, You know, so I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm more sympathetic, I guess, to the players looking at it and saying, Hey, I'm actually good enough to go play at, you know, at at a Kentucky or at an Indiana or something like that. Uh, But it is something I agree with you. You got to have somebody to manage all that look and basically have a full understanding of everything that's happening in college ball. You know, it's like, there's that kid from Niagara who averaged like 18 points a game who entered the portal yesterday. It's like, is that guy good enough to play in the Big Ten? Maybe. Um, you, you'd think maybe yes at times and maybe not at other times. Looks like we're getting spammed in chat now, Jared. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Best cams, fun, hot girls and boys video chat. Okay. Is this the sign? Do we? Is this what happens after you go two hours on YouTube? You start getting... <laughs> This kind of spam. You know, you know, what's interesting, Galen, about what you said too is you wonder if those small schools start getting better players to start with now. Yeah. Because if the upper level is pulling, you know, a couple, you know, they're only getting one or two high school recruits now and they're filling their rosters with um, you know, the lower level kids, maybe uh, your your lower level schools get better recruits and that helps them win for a year or two and and you just got to shift your mentality that i got to make these kids what they are in a year or two cuz the best ones are likely to leave it's a fascinating thing i was talking about this about iowa state i mean their ability to piece all those those players together that they've managed yep. to piece together to get to the sweet 16 and you know you look I, I think about this a lot it's like that you look at that group and where they were in various stages last year you know, Isaiah Brockington's at, at Penn State and Gabe Kalsher's at Minnesota. Did anybody look at Gabe Kalsher and say, hey, that's a guy that's going to, you know, be, be the key offensive player in a game that will get you to the Sweet 16? I mean, even he as did, he was a freshman. <laughs> well, yeah. And then and then this year he ended up with an offensive rating of 81. Um, you know, and I don't know. I find the whole scenario very fascinating yeah. of how guys piece together and, and what actually works and – how you evaluate that because it's it's just it's not apples to apples in most your cases. scouting department has to be looking at college basketball as well as the aau circuit now yep yep well you, know, you got to well, keep tra- you got to keep track of you know this guy at penn state's doing this and this guy you know if the if florida coach left um did you go to that florida roster and saying is there anyone there that if they pop we, we want to look at so the minute they pop you you you're on the phone yeah uh, maybe you know that it's just going to be a fascinating thing to to see how schools the best schools will find a way to be on top of the best transfers when they come out quick yeah. but you see it on twitter one one kid decides to transfer all of a sudden he's heard from nine schools mm-hmm. so there's got to be a lot of that going on already well that, to bring this conversation to bring this conversation full circle you know how you do this and operate in this environment and do it successfully is you have a staff that you trust right you know, fully 
and that is all pulling in the same direction and on the same page. <laughs> you don't have room for anything other than that. Yeah. Luke spam doesn't bother me, but thanks for putting that in the chat. You know, I being a coach, people said a lot worse than just sending, you know, spam in the chat, chat mob. So <laughs> take that's that how to the I, I board. just keep going on. All uh, right. All right, guys. Good Let's stuff. get out of here. <clears throat> Have a good night. It's always good to see you all, and uh, we'll catch you soon. You too, man. Peace, everyone. On the, on the flip side, perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> only only if we bring back the bison, though. So. That's right. Hey, <laughs> Galen, yeah. do you have a Final Four tradition where you watch the Final Four? I think uh, I'm going to be in town that weekend. Oh. Uh, might want to hit you up for a drink yeah. or something. Let me know. I think I think um, there's a possibility I'll be out that evening. So, uh, okay. yeah, if you my, don't have my number, uh, I'll get it. Email me. I'll send it okay. to you, and we'll uh, – yeah, let's figure something out. Yeah, my son and I are coming down for the baseball game, and then we're going to watch the Final Four and then do Bloomington right. things. Leave Mrs. Tonsoni at home and do Bloomington things. <laughs> I love it. That's, great. that's a great That's a great line. Uh, yeah, let me All know. Right, I'll I'll do some Bloomington I'll things. Be around. Absolutely. All right, guys. <laughs> See, See you. <laughs>